Now let's look at this invitation. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Many times this is accompanied by an explanation of all that Jesus can do for the person. Fix their life, their marriage, their finances, their self-esteem. So you walk up to what we know about a sinner. He is self-centered. He's autonomous. He wants to do his own thing. He has his own dreams. And he is in love with himself. So you walk up to this man and you say, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And he goes, what? God loves me? That's fantastic. I love me too. <laughs> well, this is wonderful. And you're even saying that he loves me more than I love me? Now that sounds impossible. How could anyone have such a great love? And God has a wonderful plan for my life. Oh, I have a wonderful plan for my life too. And you're telling me that if I accept this Jesus, he will help me with all my wonderful plans and I can have my best life now? Yes. Well, then I'll take a God like that. You got two of them? <laughs> Do you see that? Now you say, Brother Paul, it's, it, we don't mean it that way. That's a, but that's the way it's coming out. Now you're saying, Paul, you're being very hard, full of satire. Yes, I am. I am. But look, everybody is lamenting the fact that this country believes it's saved when it's no more saved than a... It's as lost, as they say in Alabama, as a ball in tall grass. But no one wants to point to what the problem is. And the problem is, even when we preach the gospel correctly, then we go to this thing of how to invite men that's not biblical or historical. We get them to jump through a few evangelical hoops and say yes to the appropriate questions, and we popishly pronounce them to be saved. And when they believe that false religious lie given by a religious authority, then when someone comes later and tries to preach the gospel to them because they're living in the world, they won't listen. Because a religious lie has so much power. Then the next question. Do you know you're a sinner? And oftentimes, it's really not given too seriously. It's kind of like, hey, you know we're all sinners, don't you? And if the person says, yes, I know I'm a sinner, then the question is, do you want to go to heaven? Well, yeah, I do. Then would you like to... Pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart. It'll only take five minutes. <laughs> only five minutes? Yes. Because the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them they gave, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. So would you like to receive Jesus? Because that's what the Bible says. Only take five minutes? Only five minutes, sure. And then afterwards... Often after a person prays or is led in a prayer by the evangelist, he or she is assured that if they were sincere, then Jesus has definitely come into their heart. Because he promised he would, and if he didn't come in, he's a liar because they were sincere. How many people do you know believe they're going to heaven because they're not trusting so much in Christ as they are the sincerity of the decision they made a long time ago? Oftentimes, after a few minutes of counseling, a few minutes of counseling, they are immediately presented before the church and welcomed into the family of God. Now, you tell me I'm wrong. They come down front. I've seen it so many times. They're given over to a counselor who's been trained in a package counseling form. They're talked to for about five or ten minutes while the invitation rolls on, and then immediately they're presented before the church, our new brother and sister in Christ. And that's the last most of them will ever, ever hear of conversion counseling. And then what will happen? If they never grow or if they doubt their salvation, they are taken again back to that day when they prayed and questioned regarding the sincerity of their decision. If they ever come to the pastor again doubting their salvation, he'll take them back to that day again and say, well, did you ever pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart? Yes. Were you sincere? I think so. Then it's just the devil bothering you. 
If they never grow in the things of God, their lack of growth is attributed to the lack of discipleship or the belief in the doctrine of the carnal Christian. One, one convention that I know of came to the conclusion that 60% of all its converts never attended church. And their answer for that malady was, we have to do a better job in discipleship. No. Jesus, his sheep, they hear his voice. And they follow him. Whether you disciple them or not. Now we ought to do discipleship. We ought to do discipleship. My friend, back in the 70s, Discipleship became the big thing, personal discipleship. We have just as many people leaving the back door of the church as entering into the front door of the church because we're not doing personal discipleship. No, it's because we're not preaching the gospel correctly and we're pronouncing people converted who are not converted and they went out from us because they never were of us. Now you've got to understand this. We deal five minutes with a person, their conversion, and then spend 50 years trying to disciple a goat into a sheep. I'm not saying this because I'm an angry person. I'm saying this because I'm angry because countless people are deceived. The problem is not liberal politicians. It's evangelical preachers. If they're ever challenged regarding their conversion because of a lack of fruit or overwhelming worldliness, they defend their hope of salvation by once again affirming the sincerity of their prayer and the confirmation of their religious leaders. If any counseling is done, a person is usually admonished to turn from his or her backsliding and to begin serving the Lord again. However, the validity of their conversion is never examined or ever challenged. So many people, for example, children evangelism. I would not let my child attend 98% of the Sunday school classes and vacation Bible schools in this country. And I'll tell you why. A bunch of children are brought in and they're told wonderful stories about Jesus. And then, how many of you children love Jesus? I mean, except for the kid in the back with the leather jacket and the signs on his back that have been imprinted by a cultic, you know, satanic cult. Every, other, every kid in that class is going to stand up and go, I love Jesus. Well, how many of you want to go to heaven? Oh, I do. How many of you want to pray this prayer? I will. And then they're marched off to baptism. And a lot of time, the baptismal is dressed up like some kind of a happy party time with graffiti so that they really enjoy it. And then when they're old enough to rebel against their parents, they do. And they live in gross immorality and sin. And then when they're about 25 or 30 after college, they decide they need to straighten things out because morality is really a better way to go. So they rededicate their life and they continue attending church once a week, having just enough morality to dim their conscience and send them straight to hell. That's what's going on. And when little Johnny wanders off the path and begins sleeping with his girlfriend, taking drugs, selling drugs, doing everything else, his mother and his father and his pastor goes to him and says, you're a Christian, so you need to stop living that way. Instead of saying this, you made the profession of faith in Christ, you were baptized in his name, and for a while it seemed that you did walk with him, but now you have turned away from the faith and you have proved possibly that you never knew him and you've been reprobate from the beginning. Repent and believe the gospel. Flee from the wrath to come. That's the difference. I've got to get a different group. They used to throw rocks. I'm beginning to worry. Now, I want to give you a biblical alternative. God loves me and I you know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. What about instead, this modern mantra should be replaced by a proclamation of who God is. He is the creator, sustainer, and Lord of all things. And he is worthy of your honor and obedience. Now I want you to just listen to this. In Exodus, God's proclamation, the Lord... The Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin, and yet will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. One of the greatest revelations of God in the Old Testament. Everyone knows that. Moses hid in the cleft of a rock. God proclaims his glory to Moses. And look at Mo Moses' response. Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. 
So instead of saying God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, tell them who God is. Because if you give them a God made in their own image, I guarantee you they'll accept him. But he won't be the God who saves. You tell them who God is. You exalt God before them. And tell them that everything in their life is going to have to bend toward his will. He is not like you, old man. <coughs> Repent and believe. Now. Does our gospel presentation make men excited about what God can do for them on this earth or about who God is? Now, let's go to our questions. Do you know you're a sinner? My dear friend, the question is not, do you know you are a sinner? The question is this. As you have heard me preach the gospel, has God so worked in your life that the sin you once loved, you now hate? You go up to the devil and ask him if he knows he's a sinner. You say, well, yes, I am, and a mighty fine one at that. Someone says, yes, I know I'm a sinner. Do they know what that means? That's like someone says, I've accepted God. But when you begin to hear their definition of the God they've accepted, you realize it's not the God of the Bible. In the same way, a person says, I'm a sinner. That could mean anything. I don't have enough love for myself. You must use the scriptures to teach them. The Holy Spirit using the sword. To penetrate their heart and to show them what it truly means. I was preaching years ago. And they had counselors all prepared and everything. And there was this lady leading up the counseling group. And she did not like me at all. And uh, so one night I was preaching. And there began a move of God. People over towards the left started weeping. And then they just went started going across the auditorium. People were weeping. Some almost convulsing. And I hadn't even finished the sermon, and a girl ran up and was just laying across the steps. And another person, they started weeping. And I looked up at the counselors, and the leader looked at me like, and I went, and I kept preaching. And finally, after I got through preaching, she took a step forward, and I realized she's going to bolt on me. And so I went down there, and I stood beside her, and she goes, and I said, and finally, she just looked at me and took a step, and I put my hand on her shoulder, and I said, Sister, don't touch the ark of God. It is the God of Israel who is wounding these people with regard to their sin. Do not comfort the soul that God is breaking. Leave them alone to God. So you see, the question is not simply, do you know you're a sinner? But dear friend, do you know what it means? And has God so begun to work in your heart that you're beginning to see sin as God sees sin? Are there seeds of an attitude, a divine attitude of hating sin as God hates it? You're boasting over sin as it turned to shame. Is God doing something? Now, do you want to go to heaven? That's the question. Do you want to go to heaven? You ever had anyone say, well, no, I'd, I'd rather go to hell. I've had a few people do that. But most of the part says, yes, I would like to go to heaven. My dear friend, understand this. Everyone wants to go to heaven. They just don't want God to be there when they get there. The question is not, do you want to go to heaven? The question is, do you want God? Political theory, this next election, it is all about a utopia. It is all about making a wonderful place for men to live. Even godless men want a place where they get everything they want. But the question to the sinner to whom you are witnessing is, has God done anything in your life? Is there any treasuring of Christ? Can you, are you ashamed of the way that throughout the history of your life you have ignored him, hated him, been apathetic toward him? Is there a new desire to follow him, seek him, know him, delight in him? Now, let's look at some of these texts. Because if someone answers all the questions, yes, then they're asked, do you want to pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart? We've all done it. Does it bother anyone that this formula or language is not found in the New Testament? I mean, it, we don't have, you know, Mark chapter 1, Jesus coming to Israel and saying... The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Now, who would like to accept me into their heart? We don't see on the day of Pentecost 
Okay, I see that hand. I see that hand. How many of you want to come forward now? Get them all forward. Everyone sees you. You can't go back to your seat. Now pray this prayer with me. You say, Brother Paul, you're making a mockery. Yes, I am. I am. I don't know any other way to say it. You say, but I got saved that way. You got saved in spite of that way, not because of that way. But Brother Paul, we have all these wonderful texts. Okay, let's look at them. But as many as received him. Do you honestly believe that means the sinner's prayer? Do you honestly believe that means if you don't feel comfortable praying, repeat this after me? Is that what that means? I mean, look at it. Where do you get that? One evangelist said to a guy who didn't even want to follow him in a prayer, he said, okay, I'll tell you this. I'll say the words, and if it's what you want to say to God, squeeze my hand. Behold the power of God. To receive him, I believe, should be interpreted within the context of the theology of John. It means to open up one's life to ongoing fellowship or communion with the risen Christ. John 17, 3. To receive Christ or feed upon him as the sustenance of one's life. John 6, 53. Lest you eat my flesh and drink my blood. You see, a man is saved only by faith, only by faith, believing what God has said about God, about himself, about the atoning work of Christ, the person of Christ. They're saved. But in that moment of salvation, of belief, they are opening their lives to the person of Jesus. And just because they prayed a prayer with a certain degree of sincerity is no true evidence. Because the heart is deceitfully wicked. How can you define the degree of sincerity in your own heart? You see, the evidence in, throughout all the New Testament it is this. You believe unto salvation and the evidence you believed is this. You are saved only by faith in Christ. But if you believe in Christ, your life will be open more and more to communion and fellowship with Him. It is not this flu shot mentality of an invitation of the gospel. We call men to repent and believe. And if they repent and believe truly in that moment, they are saved in that moment. But the evidence is more than just the sincerity of a prayer. It is a continuation of the working of God in their life through sanctification. Now, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. First, we must say something about the heart. It represents the core essence of what a man is. It is the seat of his intellect, mind, emotions, and will. Therefore, it is absurd to think a man can believe in Christ with his heart and it not have a radical effect on the rest of his life. Let's look at the language. Would you like to receive Jesus in your heart? What does that mean? What, have you ever thought about that? Believe in your heart, but we've changed it to, would you like to ask him to come into your heart? Believe in your heart means to believe with the very core, the very essence of who you are. It doesn't mean you open up some secret chamber and ask him to come in. It is the testimony of Scripture and the interpretation of all sound evangelical scholars that we are saved by faith alone. So why does Paul seem to add confession as a requirement of genuine conversion? Let's look at the text again. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul throughout the entire book of Romans has said salvation only by faith. So why is he now adding confession? 
Paul is not contradicting the doctrine of faith alone, but is teaching that our public confession of the Lordship of Jesus Christ is the evidence of believing in the heart. If someone is truly converted, they will publicly confess Christ in word and deed. That does not mean the same thing as presenting themselves before the church the night of their supposed conversion. If someone is truly converted, they will publicly confess Christ in word and deed. Why do I add word and deed? Because Matthew 7.21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who confesses me as Lord. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now I am not saying that we are saved by faith and works. Not at all. I am a grace preacher. What I'm saying is that salvation involves a lost doctrine. It's called regeneration. And that when God saves a man, he is regenerating his heart, turns him into a new creature. And the evidence is this, he will live like a new creature. And he will confess Christ. That is, the man who has truly believed in his heart, his life will be marked by a biblical confession of Christ in word and deed. You will be able to see with his, hear with his mouth and see with his life that his faith is a genuine saving faith. Now... I want to give you, I'm put this in a, I want to put this really quickly in a cultural perspective. Let's say that we're all a church, about 20 people, first century Roman Empire. You know from the epistle of Romans that these Christians are being put to death, some of them. They're dying like sheep. All right, now let's say that we have a, a, um, we're 20 of us, and we all work construction. So we're working on a, some kind of a building there in Rome. Construction, no problem, beautiful day. It's lunchtime, we're taking a break. Spring, we're laying out in the grass, having a good time, resting. And all of a sudden, though, we hear this. We hear drums. We look up and we see soldiers coming. And they're carrying a little altar. And on that altar is a little bowl of incense and a little fire built and we become terrified as all the construction guys come to their feet most of them unbelievers and there we are a little church in the midst of them the soldiers rally us all together and they say come forth pay homage to Caesar and so the first guy unbeliever goes up there and gets a little bit of incense throws it in the fire and says Caesar's Lord walks off as happy as he can be the next one and the next one and finally it comes to the first of us the Christians and one of us walk up Soldier prods him with the spear. Pay homage to Caesar. Jesus est in Kyrios. Jesus is Lord. And he dies. And the next one of us. Jesus is Lord. And he dies. And the next one of us. And we have taken that truth that Paul is teaching right here. That if you truly believe you will confess Christ even though it cost you your life. We have taken that beautiful truth and reduced it down. If you pray a little prayer before a bunch of people in a church in America. You can be guaranteed you're saved if you think you were sincere. That's not what it's talking about. Again. The moment a person calls upon Christ in faith, they are saved. But the evidence of salvation is not that one time in their life they were sincere when they prayed a prayer. The evidence of their salvation is, is there genuine repentance? Is there faith? And do those both evangelical graces continue on in their life and grow? In other words, the evidence of justification by faith is the ongoing work of sanctification through the Holy Spirit. Now, let's look at Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. First of all, this is not given in the context of a gospel invitation. Do you realize that? Christ is not knocking on the door of a sinner's heart. Nowhere does it say that. But he is knocking on the door of a wayward church. That's the context. This ought to raise some red flags for us. I said that to an evangelist one time, and he said, yeah, I know, Brother Paul, but it works. Secondly, I find it interesting 
that we use this text to give sinners the assurance that if they open up their hearts, Jesus will come in, even though this text does not specifically or primarily address conversion or the opening of a heart. On the other hand, we do not use Acts 16.14, which specifically and primarily speaks about both conversion and the opening of a heart. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Why don't we ever use that text? Thirdly, Instead of merely inviting the sinner to open up their lives, would it not also be appropriate to lovingly aid the sinner in self-examination to evaluate what the Lord might be doing at that moment? Do you have any sense that God is working in your heart this evening? Has there been an increase in your understanding of the gospel and the things of God? Are you more and more open to the person of Christ and the truth of Scripture and the demands of discipleship? Do you have a desire to respond to the things about which you have heard? To forsake confidence in self in your life of sin and trust in Christ alone? Fourthly, if we take this text, even if we do take it and use it for evangelism, if someone has opened the door of their life to Christ, notice this, the evidence will once again be ongoing fellowship. Because he said, if I come in, I will come in to dine with them. The evidence that a person has truly opened their life to Christ is continued fellowship with Christ. But is it not true? And don't tell me it's not. Countless millions of people, because of our preaching, walk around. They have no fellowship with Christ, no desire for godliness, no seeking of God. But they believe themselves converted because one time in one of our churches they prayed and asked Jesus to come in. That's true. 